Welcome and thank you for joining us. I am Kate Fellens from Strauss and Company, a fine art auction house in South Africa, and I have the pleasure to introduce this evening's discussion around William Kendridge. We are joined today by a truly impressive group of curators, each of whom presents William Kendridge to their local community. Melanie Herzog from the Warehouse Art Museum in Milwaukee, Adrian Locke from the Royal Academy of London, Ed Shad from the Broad in Los Angeles, Owen Martin and Carol Nell from the Norville Foundation in South Africa. We find it particularly interesting that William Kentridge is exhibited over three continents, Europe, USA, and Africa. And we will explore the similarities and challenges of staging these exhibitions in tonight's talk. We speak briefly with each curator, and then there is a group discussion at the end. We will explore what it means to be a curator, both locally and across borders with this prolific artist. Thank you. The curator we want to talk about first is Melanie Herzog. She is Professor Emerita of Art History at Edgewood College. She currently teaches as Senior Lecturer in the Department of Art History Theory and Criticism at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and the Department of African American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, with an emphasis on artists' encounters across cultural and geographical borders, socially engaged artistic practice and intersections of race, ethnicity, gender, and visual representation. Professor Herzog publishes and lectures widely on modern and contemporary North American art and visual culture. Her publications include Elizabeth Catlett, an American artist in Mexico, Milton Rogobin, the making of a social documentary photographer, and many articles, chief of which Woman of Metal, Innovation, Connection, and Education. That article was published in the book, Woman of Metal. And another article, Elizabeth Catlett in Mexico at the Century, Navigating Gender and Visual Politics Across Cultural Borders. And that article appeared in American Women Artists, 1935 to 1970, Gender, Culture, and Politics. And more recently, African American Artists and Mexico in the August publication, The Rutledge Companion to African American Art History, published quite recently in 2020. And in addition, additional exhibition catalog essays and book chapters. She holds a Master of Fine Arts in Ceramics and a PhD in Art History from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Welcome, Melanie. Uh, you, uh, I think. For me, the two major publications are these two, Elizabeth Catlett and Milton Rogovin. And in a way, I want to speculate that your research, compiling and writing these two books actually prepared you in a manner for this big task of curating a major Cambridge exhibition. What do you say about that? Well, first of all, thank you for, for that affirmation of my work and thank you for including me in this fabulous international webinar. Several people have asked me, actually quite a few people have asked me how I, as somebody who has studied artists from North America, have been prepared to work on and curate an exhibition of a South African artist. And I think even despite that geographic difference or that distance, thinking about what it means to work across national, international borders, what it means to engage with social questions and social issues, what it means to engage with communities of resistance and make art that's about, um, oftentimes about visibility of issues that aren't seen in art and to represent ideas and concepts and ways of knowing that haven't always been addressed in art. Thinking about those sorts of questions for a long time, I think, prepared me for this work. Also, Elizabeth Catlett is, of course, or was a printmaker and sculptor primarily. And so um, I've had a lot of time to think about those art mediums that Kent Ridge engages among many others. And Milton Rogovin as a photographer, of course, uh, photography is a really important part of Kentridge's practice as well. So I think all of those pieces, both the um, kind of conceptual and um, art practice focused ways of working are relevant here. Yeah. Okay, uh, I thought as much, and uh, your show is hosted 
uh, in this very charming building, uh, the Warehouse Art Museum in Milwaukee. Tell us a, a little about this museum. <clears throat> The Warehouse Art Museum, it's a private art museum. The exhibition space is located on the ground floor, the, the entry level floor. And it's an exhibition space that is, as I say, it's relatively small. It's a private art museum and research center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It specializes in modern and contemporary art. And it opened in 2018 and, and most of what it, it exhibits is from the permanent collection, which is a collection of more than 3,600 works of art, and it's an international um, collection. It reflects the interests and the passions of Jan Sayre and John Shannon, who established um, the museum, and it also features one of the largest private collections of works of art by William Kentridge. Okay. Uh, your particular, uh, your specific Kentridge show is called See for Yourself, and I want us, uh, uh, I want you to take us through this uh, exhibition. Well, first of all, let me say something about um, my, my aim in curating this exhibition and the opportunity and the challenges that that presented. Uh, because curating an exhibition from the holdings of one collection presents an opportunity. It's the opportunity to bring, in this case, privately held works into public view and to show work that hasn't been previously exhibited. And this exhibition ranges from early prints. There are some prints from the 1970s all the way up to last year. And this was one overarching aim for Jan Sayre and John Shannon. And this is, of course, their collection. They also wanted the exhibition to feature the, the interactive aspects of Kent Ridge's work. So the challenge that I felt as a curator of this exhibition was to simultaneously introduce Kent Ridge to an audience who might be seeing his work for the first time or might not be aware of the scope of his work and also to offer new insights or fresh ways of seeing for viewers who are deeply familiar with his work. Also, you know, to bring a fresh view, so many brilliant people have curated Kentridge exhibitions and, and written about him. So I had to think about what story I wanted the exhibition to tell and how this story should honor Jan and John's vision. And they chose the title, William Kentridge, See for Yourself, which I think is wonderful as I'm asking people to think about the limits and the possibilities of art as a means of making sense of the world. And what you're seeing here are um, the, the banner ad for the exhibition uh, featuring one of uh, Kent Ridge's print images. And then you're also seeing the cover for the gallery guide that was produced that includes an essay that I wrote and then several of uh, Kent Ridge's pieces laying out the themes of the exhibition. The exhibition has three overarching themes that are emphasized in the wall text and also in this gallery guide. The first of those is the processes of making, of making art that are key to William Kentridge's practice, multiple forms and mediums grounded in drawing. And this theme looks at how ideas are generated and meaning is constructed through his activities of making and looking. The second of these kind of overarching themes is the processes of making meaning in which we as viewers, as well as the artist, participate. And his work invites us to make meaning through seeing for ourselves, right? There's our title, while recognizing that meaning is conditional and ambiguous and sometimes contradictory. And then the Third theme is Kent Ridge's engagement with the world, the way in which he invites the world into his studio and the ways that he takes um, his work into the world. So I wanted to take those ideas and kind of flesh those out in the exhibition. So I'll take you through the exhibition. It opens with introductory wall text that you see in that outer section. You can see it in the image on the right that has the life sign, kind of where the walls are gold. There's a large wall text there. 
And it begins with Kentridge's own words when he said, my work is about a process of drawing that tries to find a way between what we know and what we see. So that outer section introduces the exhibition's themes and it highlights his, his process, how his um, exploration of one form of expression often resonates in another form or medium. Even though we only are showing one of his films, this text talks about how his films and his prints and his sculptures are anchored in drawing and might look really different from where he begins his process. And then it, this text also describes ways that his work invites us to look and to look again. And it emphasizes the uh, collaborative aspects of his work. And finally, it emphasizes that while a lot of his work is, is very personal and very evocative, the outside world is also reflected in his work and it inflects his work, um, I think, pretty consistently in the ways in which he's responding to legacies of colonialism and apartheid and remembered and forgotten histories and the passage of time. And then as we move into the exhibition space, you're seeing kind of what you would see as you look into the space on the left with a sign above that says studio. On the other side, the sign says life so that we get the sense of studio and life being this place of both passage and place of meeting. So we have these um, this series of recent photogravures of film stills that introduces his art practice in this studio life section at the beginning and emphasizes again, those themes of, of making of the studio is both a physical and metaphorical space where ideas take form. And the text here that you can see on the blue panel there, again, um, quotes William Kentridge when he says, the world is invited into the studio. It is taken apart and fragmented the fragments are reordered and sent back into the world as a song, a drawing, or a piece of theater. And so these film stills introduce um, his, his studio practice and the way in which life is part of that practice. Because that, that connection of studio and life is, is so important. Another thing that I wanted to emphasize in this opening section right away is that while Kentridge's art serves as a kind of witness and testimony to conditions and events in South Africa, right, in the troubled history of South Africa, there's also play and there's whimsy and there's humor and sensuality and beauty in his work. And I think we see that in these initial photogravures, his depiction of the intimacy of daily life and his own portrayal of himself, right, as an embodied being. And so this section emphasizes this and it makes the point with these photogravures that most recently as the COVID-19 pandemic constricted his activities to his studio, right? Life came into the studio in that new way. His work has become an expression of mourning for the tremendous loss of life in South Africa and globally. Here are examples of two of those photogravures so that you can see what we're showing on those initial walls. Then we move into the, the early years section and each section has a, one of those um, text panels. You can see it in blue on the wall. Here we open with Kentridge's earliest work in the collection to say something about his life, his biography, and also to highlight his geographic and social location in South Africa during the years of apartheid and the transition to democracy while summarizing his development as an artist. And most of this section, uh, most of what's displayed here is prints so that the audience can think about themes and processes in his printmaking and his drawing, and also considering his printmaking, the influence of earlier socially engaged printmakers in South Africa and also in Europe. And I think um, my idea was to lay the groundwork for the rest of the exhibition here and thinking about how his work is grounded in drawing, even as it soon expanded to a whole range of mediums. 
And so you're seeing here a couple of those uh, early prints that are featured in this section. Thinking about that interactive nature of his work and the processes of making meaning, we have a section that's called the process of seeing. And actually this section of the exhibition was conceived as its own section, but the works are kind of scattered throughout the display space because of the need to make enough room for people to move around in the space and not get too crowded around um, any one work of art. So this section features optical devices like the phenopistoscope that you're seeing here. And there are stereoscopes, stereo viewers that are examples of how Kentridge investigates the physical process of seeing and how seeing shapes our understanding of the world. And the text for this section and the work in this section also highlights sculptures that take on different views from different viewing angles, like the example you're seeing here, and anamorphic drawings that cohere when we look at them as reflections in the curved surface of a cylinder. So that these are really an invitation to consider the illusory nature of perception. They invite us to, to look and look again so that what Kentridge is doing here is so brilliant. He's undermining the veracity of visual perception and suggesting the instability of our constructions of the world and the mutability of truth. There's also a section on opera and performance that highlights his collaborative work. And then we move into this section called Processions of the Dispossessed. And I'm showing you a, a view of the gallery as you would be experiencing it if you were there. And then uh, giving you a detail of a couple of his images of processions, one showing you the uh, installation view as well as the piece itself. This section brings together works that invoke histories of displacement and migration in South Africa and other parts of the world. And several of them are circular, like the phenokistoscope too, that we saw in the previous slide. And I think this circularity is really important because it evokes an unending cycle of refugees fleeing wars and oppression um, exile and loss, thinking about how these mass movements of people because of colonization, because of war, because of all of the reasons that people are forced to move from their homeland to somewhere else. These have happened in the past, they're happening now, and they happen again and again and again. It is an unending cycle that I think is being um, evoked here. And this is something that I think Kentridge is, is thinking about. In the text for this section and, and in the details that I'm showing you here, you can see how Kentridge uses maps gleaned from outdated atlases as substrates for some of his tableaus of migration. And I think that these maps, along with representing geographic locations, are important because they resonate with those histories of colonialism and conflict and war that have shaped the, the locales that they chart. And then you can see that he also superimposes other processions, right? These figures walking, oftentimes carrying burdens onto printed pages of books. And I love that he emphasizes that these are neither rare nor valuable books when he prints on them and cuts them apart and uses chine collé, these pasted pieces of paper onto these printed pages. He takes the books apart and reconfigures them. So he releases them from any kind of predetermined order, suggesting something of the, the randomness of these occurrence in a way that I think connects to that unending nature of these, um, these forced dislocations and relocations. So I think that the Printed words and the maps are important to highlight as a layer of associative meaning for these arrays of dispossessed humanity. And the collection also includes some pieces that relate to Kentridge's major project in Rome, Triumphs and Laments. This is a small gallery space. So, you know, as I think about 
what's on view at the Royal Academy in London, what's going to be on view at the Broad in Los Angeles, right? Much larger uh, institutions with larger exhibition space, bringing in work that isn't from one collection. In this exhibition at the warehouse, I think it's really important and fabulous that we're able to show these larger scale pieces, pieces that are part of this uh, major project that is a subset of the processions of the dispossessed theme. I think that triumphs and laments expands our consideration of Kentridge's processions. And this, um, for, for folks who are listening who may not know, is a the main piece that you see in the photograph in the upper left is a 500 meter long frieze on the banks of the Tiber River in Rome, representing a monumental procession that reveals the unfolding of time throughout the span of the city's history. And this installation acknowledges that triumphs for some are also cause for others' laments. And this is something that uh, Kentridge has, has talked quite a lot about. The uh, procession traverses the space between the Vatican and the site of Rome's Jewish ghetto, which was established simultaneously with the rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica um, in Rome. And Kentridge said, I didn't know this shameful piece of history was also a product of the Renaissance. So a moment of glory for the city was also a moment of shame. The point is that both glory and shame happened together at the same moment. So on the gallery walls, we see these monumental prints that are translated from Kentridge's preparatory drawings for triumphs and lament. And they become these prints that are monumental when they're unfolded on the wall. They're, on, they're printed onto raw cotton cloth and they can be folded up like maps to become these small portable objects. And I think here's where this theme of dispossession takes on another really important resonance, right? These physical objects suggest what people are able to carry with them when they are forced into dislocation, dispossession, and what they have to leave behind. So there's this idea of movement as well as the history that's invoked here. And I think that this, um, this section also says something about permanence and impermanence by invoking the uh, triumphs and laments freeze because of the way in which that was made. And so the, in the gallery, that's also described the way in which this was made by essentially erasing grime from that wall along the river to reveal not only that that grime had built up for centuries to tell this story of triumph and lament, of dispossession and procession, and also to remind us that through the passage of time, this freeze will once again be obscured as the grime, the pollution, the gunk on the wall uh, builds itself up again. And the last section of the exhibition is called Tying Words to the World, Bringing Together the Exhibition's Themes. And it opens with another quote from William Kentridge, we operate with how language ties us to the world and enables us to make meaning both of the world and of ourselves. So this section highlights how words are significant in his work as he's exploring the instability of language and the associations it conjures and the relationship of words to the world. And again, we're seeing words, text overlaid upon printed pages of text, dictionaries and encyclopedias and other lexicons that contain knowledge that ranges from the esoteric to the everyday. And we see Kentridge again drawing upon the writing of a number of um, important thinkers, of philosophers, of people like Theodore Adorno, who he has looked to um, and found meaningful throughout his entire career. And you're seeing here one of the sculptures that is in this section, his um, sculpture that from one point of view, as you're seeing it in the installation shot, looks like 
kind of shapes and lines welded together and then coheres into this view of the nose uh, striding along on the sort of structure that we see so often in Kentridge's work. And so I wanted you to see an example of one of these pieces that coheres as you look at it from a particular vantage point, right? To show, to show how we're inviting people to look and to look again and to think about how we make sense of the world through that act of, of looking and through, through seeing. And this section of the exhibition also points out kind of as viewers leave and go back out underneath that sign that says um, studio on one side and life on the other side. This last section points out that um, Kentridge looks to um, the Dada artists in Switzerland and Germany and their embrace of absurdism during and after World War I as he's thinking about ambiguities and contradictions, particularly in terms of South Africa's history and contemporary realities. So as viewers depart the gallery space, they see this sculptural homage to Emmy Hemmings, who was one of the originators of Dada at Zurich's Cabaret Voltaire during World War I. And she's somebody who embraced multiple forms of experimentation and expression in the performing arts as Kentridge does as well in the visual arts and in the performing arts. And I think it's also important that this portrait takes the form of the shadow puppets that he constructed for um, a number of his performance works, his triumphs and laments procession and other performance pieces that are multimedia events, I think in some ways in the spirit of, of Dada performance. This is the floor plan of the gallery. And you can see that it is a large room. It's one large room with some fixed walls and also some movable walls. One, one thing that I'm really proud of, and I'm proud of the people who work at the warehouse, is that we really wanted to include one of Kentridge's films. We wanted to show secondhand reading. And so the Kentridge studio gave us some very particular specifications for how this work was to be installed. And so in the um, kind of upper right hand side underneath the key to the exhibition, you see the little room with the squiggly lines, those are the curtains. And so that space, which had some, has some interactive aspects, there's a chalkboard that people can draw on, there's a typewriter of the sort that appears often in Kentridge's work. There's a telephone, like the rotary phone that we see in his work. There are books that people can look at. And then there's this space where people move through these curtains into a little viewing room where, where secondhand reading is projected. So that space was able to be created using the space of the gallery, movable walls, and some really ingenious um, installation. But this is the space that we worked with, working around those round pillars, working around the fixed walls and movable walls, because as the name of the warehouse suggests, it's a warehouse. And so we're working essentially with a warehouse space that I think is actually quite lovely for a Kentridge exhibition, because he does work on a grand scale often, and there are of course these grand scale exhibitions happening. And he works on a more intimate scale. And this is a more, even though it's a largest space, it's got kind of, you know, not super high ceilings. And so compared to a large museum space, it is a more intimate viewing experience. And the scale of, the lot of, of a lot of the work in this collection is more intimate. So I think it gets at kind of an aspect of Kentridge's work um, that's really important and that's able to be uh, featured in, in a space such as this. Right, um, uh, so, so Melanie, uh, did you plan any special events um, uh, to accompany this exhibition in Milwaukee? 
Yes, and here's where I must give credit to the, the people who work at the warehouse. Um, I am a guest curator, so these special events were planned by um, Jan Serge, John Shannon, and their fabulous staff. And a number of these events are going to be taking place at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And I'm showing here uh, two views, the exterior view, this very iconic view of the uh, Calatrava addition to the building, and then you're seeing the interior space. Uh, this is perhaps what has uh, made Milwaukee known to many in the art world around the world. Uh, so I thought that I would kind of anchor talking about these events with, with showing you uh, the Milwaukee Art Museum. So there will be a talk by William Kentridge at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Very exciting that he's coming to uh, Wisconsin. There will be a presentation by a uh, Milwaukee group called Present Music in partnership with the Warehouse Art Museum called Interplay, Kentridge and Miller. And this will be a screening of animated short films by William Kentridge with live music featuring a new commission by South African composer Philip Miller. There will be performances of Pepper's Ghost created by William Kentridge and the Center for the Less Good Idea. Um, those will be, I believe, at Skylight Music Theater in Milwaukee. There is a symposium over the course of two different days in October and November on apartheid in South Africa and Jim Crow, the system of institutionalized segregation in the Southern United States. There will be a um, site-specific dance performance by Milwaukee's Wild Space Dance Company called Dances at the Edge of Understanding inspired by Kent Ridge's ideas that I believe is taking place at the Warehouse Art Museum. There will also be a dance performance by Milwaukee's Koti Dance Company, which documents, interprets, and performs dance and music rooted in Africa and the cultures of the African diaspora. There is a recorded discussion about Kent Ridge and printmaking launching soon um, that features Jessica Munich Ganger, who's a professor of print and narrative forms at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Department of Art and Design, and Kim Berman from Artist Proof Studio in South Africa. Strauss and Company produced that. There will also be several other programs on Kent Ridge's art processes, such as stop motion animation. There's going to be a presentation on um, Kent Ridge's artist books his use of optical devices. So lots of exciting programming that the Warehouse Art Museum has, has come up with. Now, certainly an action-packed uh, program that you've organized there. Very, very impressive. Uh, and for everybody watching this, uh, please put Milwaukee on your bucket list. Visit the uh, Warehouse Art Museum and, of course, this spectacular world-class uh, museum. It is absolutely phenomenal. Um, Melanie, what I really appreciate about your presentation is the very careful manner in which you conceptualized and execute the whole exhibition. But most important for me is you always had the viewer in mind when you put it together, how you exhibited it, uh, how the viewer can actually optimally engage with the various art uh, pieces on show there. Uh, so I really think it's not only about the art, it's not only about Kentridge, but it's also the viewer's experience and aesthetic enjoyment of the show. And that really stands out for me. And the one thing we there should add are. somewhere, maybe you can add this um, in, is that William Kentridge, see for yourself, is on view until December 16th. So okay. lots of time for people okay. to uh, come and see this exhibition. It's open Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. Admission okay. is free. Our second curator is Adrian Locke from the Royal Academy. Adrian, tell us about your William Kentridge exhibition. <clears throat> 
Well, our exhibition has been in the planning for the last four years. Obviously, it uh, was impacted by the pandemic, so it's been delayed by a year. But it's a major survey of William's work over the last 40 years, spread across what we call our main galleries at the Royal Academy. So a very large, impressive um, neoclassical galleries. So nice contrast with William's work to have in these sort of lavish gild gilded galleries um, with a, a complete kind of overview of what William has done in his uh, time as an artist and how he has developed this very particular style uh, and how the, I suppose, most importantly for me is the impact of drawing, as that, that everything emanates from drawing, so that we start with drawing and we end with drawing and in between you get this whole vision of who and what William is. You mentioned the new classical galleries and how did you organize the layout of the exhibition then? So we've been working very closely with William and his uh, incredible studio team in Johannesburg. And as you can see, we have a pretty substantial amount of space given over. Um, it's something like 20,000 square feet, 2,000 square meters. So it's a big space. Um, and for those people who aren't familiar with the Royal Academy, um, it is, let me just show you the, this picture here. It's an old, uh, it was a private house uh, in London, belonging to Lord Burlington. And in the 1860s, it was handed by the government to the Royal Academy of Arts. And these galleries were purpose built in the gardens. So they were always built to show art. Um, and so they have this uh, grandeur around them, which reflects the period in which they were built. And also the scale of them was very ambitious for the time. Uh, and in order to reach the galleries, you have to go up a large uh, staircase. This was uh, part of the staircase of the private house. Um, and then uh, you uh, will come across this plasterwork action, one of William's oversized uh, sculptures. You can just see in the bottom right hand corner there, uh, a, a sort of detail of what you might see. And then as you go through the exhibition, you're introduced to William's early drawings, the drawings around the uh, front of the drawings for projection, the Soho drawings. Um, and to your left is his very famous film, of course, on Ubu, um, very uh, strident political statement piece. Um, and we go in, then into our main gallery, which is called Gallery 3, where we're going to show five of William's 11 uh, Soho films. Uh, and they will all be showing continually on different screens. So it'll be a sort of uh, overwhelming, I think, kind of experience for people walking in there. You'll be walking straight into William's imagination and his animation at its full, at full blast, I think. So it'll be, a, it'll be really a, a dynamic space. And then in, in the next gallery, of course, because the Royal Academy has very established history, of showing art from uh, across the world and from all types of periods. You know, we are, William very much wanted to have a room of tapestries which reflects the kind of uh, types of exhibitions that we've shown in the past of historical uh, material. And he has made uh, tapestries specifically for this space. So the largest tapestry he's made to date, which is six meters wide, uh, has been made for that space. So we'll have a, a, a sort of wonderful moment of respite after all the films, we'll go, we'll go down into a more contemplative space, uh, quieter space, uh, if you can call it that, because of course, William's images are so filled with activity and animation in themselves. And I was very keen, uh, given uh, the sort of history of Britain, uh, well, Great Britain, really Scotland, England uh, as well, um, of exploration of the 19th century and publication of explorers' accounts. I, re I very much wanted to have a sequence of the colonial drawings from the mid 90s. So we've put these in the next gallery and just this with more recent drawings from the head and the load, the 2018 piece that he uh, produced. Um, so the notion of how William is still engaging with landscape, but how landscape now conveys different meanings for him. Uh, and then uh, in uh, the middle gallery, really, gallery <clears throat> six, we've done something that William has been doing quite a lot of recently, which is to have a space dedicated to the, uh, the studio, um, in which uh, you get a sense of what it is like to be in William's studio, the types of activity that take place. 
Um, and here I've tried to be uh, uh, a little bit more, um, I wouldn't say ambitious as the word, but I've wanted to show some of William's working practices as well. So as well as finished works and drawings and bronzes, I mean, it has a whole gamut of different uh, types of work in there to show the range of activities that William involves himself with or engages with. Um, we've also got some preliminary drawings uh, and some unseen, previously unseen, unpublished uh, preparatory drawings, um, artist proofs, and um, one unpublished print. So just to give a sense of the activity that takes place, also the very hands-on um, adjustments and edits that William makes to prints as they're in progress. So we have their prints, woodcuts, in, um, we have, uh, we have uh, sculpture, we have a small film. Uh, so there's a real sense of, of the sorts of activity that William engages with and, and, and uses with his work. In the central hall, we have the new remastered and remodeled black box Chambre Noir, which is this brought that from the Louisiana Museum of Denmark. And this is a piece that looks at uh, colonial activities in Africa. It's a very uh, moving and very um, engaging work. But I think the, like a lot of things that William does, people are drawn to the immediacy of the work before they start to realize what's unfolding before their eyes and the narrative of the work and the activities that are taking place that can be somewhat distressing and challenging for people. Um, especially when he's engaging with the, the colonial activities in the African continent. Um, the next, uh, you have to then go back out into Gallery 7, which is given over to these tremendous large um, drawings of flowers. Over, I mean, they're just, I think people, when they see them reproduced, have no sense of the scale of these works. So it'll be, it'll be quite a dramatic shift. Um, and also you get the, the shift from William working in charcoal to William working with Indian ink. So the notion of uh, what he considers to be drawing, moving into a different media and using a different implement, obviously a brush. Uh, that's followed by notes towards the model opera, the uh, piece that he made for the exhibition he did in Beijing, um, which sort of transposes the uh, model operas of, um, uh, of communist China into an African context, South African context. Uh, the following gallery is the, again, these oversized uh, tree drawings. So it would be like, in a, like a little copse, a little forest, uh, before you go into uh, Sybil, which is a new work, um, which looks at um, the, the, the role of the Sybil as an oracle, as someone you would go to consult your fate. So there is an, a play on the leaves of the trees and the leaves on which people wrote their um, petitions to the civil for her to answer. Um, so there's a very nice connection there. And then that, that, that terminates the exhibition. You go back out through the forest and you leave. Okay. Uh, absolutely fascinating. I think it is a, it's a very sensual and uh, uh, sensory experience and a perfect flow. Uh, I think you captured uh, the vast uh, tracts of his oeuvre in your layout, and I'm sure that people will have a fantastic, brilliant time. Okay, uh, I, I, have you planned any special events for your uh, to accompany the exhibition? Mm. Yeah, so we're very excited about our special events um, around the exhibition. As you know, William is a very busy person, so it's always wonderful to get his time, uh, and he's been incredibly supportive uh, of the project from the outset. Um, we have uh, a, a lecture which is part of a series called the Long Rothschild Lecture, which William will give in September. We have uh, an in conversation uh, with Samira Ahmed uh, on the 3rd of November. This will be a live streamed um, broadcast, so this will be very exciting. We have a, a beautiful lecture theatre, so that will take place there. But Obviously, it's, it's limited by its capacity. So we live stream to encourage more people to participate. Um, we are also working in conjunction with the Barbican, which is another exhibition uh, and theatre venue in London, to uh, William is doing a, an iteration of the Centre for the Less Good Idea with the Barbican, and we're showing two uh, works associated with the Centre 
at the RA, one with um, William um, and the other will be Kafka's Ape. So we're doing or Sonata and Kafka's Ape. So we have a very vibrant um, program uh, around the exhibition involving William. Um, so there's, uh, I think it's a, a big moment in London for William because he also will uh, have activities taking place. So uh, William is kind of taking over London uh, through in the autumn this year. And rightly so. And I think there's also a, a, a catalogue you published. Mm. Yeah, so we, uh, funnily enough, we just got the first advanced copies yesterday. Uh, and it's a, a stunning, uh, stunning book. Uh, I, I, I mean, I've looked at lots and lots of books on William. Um, and of course, I'm biased, but I think it's a very handsome book. But it also has a, a really, I think, and uh, I claim no credit for this, but it has a uh, an extremely interesting um, series of kind of in conversation pieces, not with William, but about William by Stephen Klingman. Uh, so the text is, 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 is quite a different take on William from those I've, I've seen elsewhere, um, but is, is, is really fascinating. And for those people who are not so familiar with South Africa, it gives uh, insights, uh, um, really interesting insights into um, William's kind of emergence, I suppose, and, and um, how the situation in South Africa has been very challenging for artists. The next curator is Ed Chad. He is the curator and publication manager at the Broad in Los Angeles. He's a graduate of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and he has created large scale survey exhibitions of Shirine Sat. Takashi Murakami, and now William Kentridge. He also curated the large public project, Carlos uh, Cruz uh, Diaz, Colia at Additive, co curated a trilogy of group exhibitions, Creature, Oracle, and A Journey That Wasn't, and was the host curator of Jasper John's Something Resembling Truth, co-organized by the Broad and the Royal Academy in London. Its writing has been included in Art Review, Freeze, Modern Painters, Flash Art, the Brooklyn Rail, the LA Weekly, uh, Truth Dick, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. In addition, he has contributed essays to monographic catalogues of the work of Robin Irvin, Natalie Frank, Sterling Ruby, Taz Oshiri, uh, uh, Enrico Martinez, uh, Celia, and Lapin, Charles uh, Carabidian, Peter Fermesh, and uh, Liad Yoshifor. Uh, Ed, tell us about your Cambridge exhibition. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Wilhelm. Uh, it's good to be able to introduce our effort here at uh, the Broad Museum in Los Angeles. I've been working uh, with William on this exhibition for about three years. Uh, it was uh, developed initially in 2019, and I'm happy to speak about it. Um, the title of our exhibition is William Kentridge in Praise of Shadows. Uh, and the exhibition uh, will run in Los Angeles opening November 12th and, and going through April 9th of 2023. Um, the Broad Museum uh, is, just to give you a little background about it, a very new member of the Los Angeles cultural scene. Uh, we are right across the street uh, from the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles. Uh, we are adjacent to uh, Frank Gehry's Disney Hall. Uh, and our building is designed by Diller, Scofidio, and Renfro. Uh, and we opened uh, this uh, museum in 2015 uh, based on the collection of Eli and Edith Broad a collection that has been accumulated over the course of 50 years. However, the Broad has uh, in subsequent years uh, greatly expanded our program uh, to do significant deep dives of artists that are collected by the museum. Uh, these are extensive uh, loan shows uh, with loans coming from all over the world. Uh, we've done uh, the two that I've participated in, uh, as, as, as mentioned, were uh, Shireen Nishat uh, and Takashi Murakami. 
Uh, and William, uh, the work of William Kentridge, figures very prominently in the collection. Uh, we have a, a core grouping of 18 works, uh, including the monumental installation, Refusal of Time. So William's work is very important to our museum and very important uh, to the Museum of Eli and Edith Broad. Uh, one of the things that I, I would like to mention about the Broad that makes us uh, very unique uh, globally as an institution is the average age of our audience uh, is 32 years old. Uh, most of the people that come through our doors are students, uh, mm -hmm. people in their 20s. Uh, and this uh, we uh, uh, foresee as being an entirely new audience uh, for William Kentridge's work, uh, an entirely new generation uh, to take in uh, the work of uh, this very important artist. Very impressive. So the first question uh, that, that, that a curator asks themselves, uh, why this exhibition? Why now? Why this city? Why this work? And so in conceptualizing this exhibition to present an initial proposal, uh, to William, I thought about a couple of things. The first thing I thought about is that, of course, Los Angeles uh, is uh, one of several centers of the movie industry. We're Hollywood. Uh, that is the that is the uh, driving force behind the city of Los Angeles. And in 2022, when we'll be opening the exhibition of William Kentridge, is a time that Los Angeles is really taking stock of the history of cinema. Uh, the Academy of Motion Pictures Museum uh, recently opened on Wilshire Boulevard to great acclaim. Uh, the George Lucas uh, Museum of Narrative Arts is going to open in, in a few years. I don't know exactly the date. But as a whole, this is a time where Los Angeles is looking at itself uh, as a member of a wider global community of, of, of cinema. Los Angeles likes to think that it is the center of global cinema, uh, perhaps a bit arrogantly. Uh, and so uh, this uh, is, is one of the ways that, that, that I started to think about uh, Williams' work. When you get into the work of William Kentridge, it is full of cinematic devices. Uh, there's an ex there is an exhibition of the Richard Balzer uh, collection at the Academy of Motion Pictures uh, in, uh, 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 that is up right now. Uh, that, is, uh, that is a festival of stereoscopes, phrenastoscopes, uh, kinoscopes, uh, all these different historical devices that have come to be known as proto-cinema or sort of forerunners uh, to cinema. But the work of William Kentridge, as I'll talk a little bit about in this presentation, runs entirely against the grain of that. Uh, William, at least the way that I interpret his work, I, I don't see him uh, as, 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 as being particularly interested in cinematic devices building to a culmination point uh, in which they become film and cinema. Instead, he takes the sort of progress of that or presumed progress of that, and he jumps right into it and he takes it apart. He celebrates these machines, uh, takes apart this idea that there is one way of seeing, that there is a building point towards cinema. So in thinking about William in reference to the city of Los Angeles, uh, this was an incredibly uh, provocative thing to think about, to the idea of having someone come to our museum and enter an entirely different world uh, that that is not 
the world of Star Wars, that is not the world of Avatar, that is not the world really of conventional cinema, uh, that literally takes uh, the idea of a studio in the way that LA thinks about it with producers and giant teams uh, and, and gargantuan amounts of money and presents a new way of thinking about it, uh, a new way, taking the traditional atelier of the artist, uh, the visual artist, uh, and, 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 and taking that studio into the narrative of cinema. This uh, was, a, was a wonderful thing to think about. So the other thing that I wanted to think about was that uh, the United States uh, in Los Angeles is going through a time of racial reckoning. Uh, after uh, the murder of George Floyd, uh, it is very apparent uh, that we are uh, analyzing, taking apart, and critiquing the way that we tell our stories. Who tells the stories? What type of power dynamics figure into these stories? Are they based on a sense of structural racism? What are the structures that underlie narratives? So when it comes to the city of Los Angeles and when it comes to uh, a, an artist to choose for an exhibition, uh, William seemed profound uh, that, that we tell this story at this moment. And so, the title of our exhibition, In Praise of Shadows, comes from a lecture that, that William has given many times uh, about, uh, about reinventing uh, the idea of, of, of the, the big allegory of Plato's cave, uh, the direction, who is the enlightened, uh, who are those by which the enlightened impose their power, and what can we do? What can we do uh, to upend that and make sure uh, that uh, people, real people that are left out of these narratives, that are left out of these stories, that are run roughshod by these narratives of apartheid, of colonialism, how can those voices be heard? How can those voices be praised? And can we think about this through cinema? Can we think about this uh, through the dynamics of how Los Angeles tells its stories? And so that is really what this exhibition is about. And that is why, um, uh, that, that is why I think William is a, is a perfect artist uh, for this moment. Another thing that it absolutely must be said is that um, both, uh, both uh, myself and William uh, were both white men. Uh, in positions of privilege. Uh, and one of the amazing things about the work of William Kentridge is it shows that privilege unraveling. It shows someone becoming conscious of who they are and who they are in relationship to the pain of others, uh, in, in, in relationship to the pain of, of, of uh, uh, on which structurally their privilege relies. Uh, William's work is essential in thinking about consciousness that way and how we can take apart the tyranny of that point of view. So the, 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 the exhibition at the Broad is extraordinarily ambitious. Uh, it takes up 10,000 square feet uh, the centerpiece of the exhibition is the monumental refusal of time. And if I have to, if I have to say uh, uh, one of the things that distinguishes this exhibition from uh, recent uh, uh, surveys of William Kentridge is that uh, uh, we are uh, presenting this extraordinarily difficult uh, to install and, and to display work. It happens to be part of the Baroque collection, so it's also a celebration of who we are uh, as, as curators, as collectors, as interpreters of contemporary art. And so um, we had to go for it. We had to commit to refusal of time and build uh, a, a giant 
uh, breathing, thinking, cinematic machine uh, in our uh, in our cavernous uh, lobby of the Broad. And so uh, uh, we're working with uh, uh, William's longtime exhibition designer, Sabine, uh, who has been a, a tremendous resource and incredible collaborator on this exhibition. She also designed uh, the exhibition at the Royal Academy. And in my first meeting with Sabine is like, how can we make this different? How can we build an exhibition for Los Angeles that tells our story uh, through William's eyes? Uh, and um, our story is different from London's story. Uh, our, uh, our way of existing in our city and in our country is different from the way the Royal Academy or, or Zeitz Mocha or the Norval Foundation exists inside of their ecosystems, inside of, of their worlds. And so Sabine was an extraordinary person to work with. Uh, and as we've built this exhibition, uh, uh, I, I'd like to think that the, that the path through this show uh, is going to be an entrance into William's thinking mind, his moving body, uh, uh, his, how his charcoal drawings uh, become all of these crazy machines and all of these projections and anamorphic devices, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But I really want people to come into the Broad and, and enter uh, a, uh, what I'm calling an inventor in reverse, a person who takes apart the machinery of how we tell our stories. Uh, and I want people to feel that. One of the things, uh, one of the things about visiting William in Johannesburg and working with him there, and I had the pleasure of doing that for two weeks. And then it should be said, having my two weeks extended by an additional 10 days by contracting COVID uh, in Johannesburg. So uh, the three weeks I spent, you know, traveling around South Africa from Johannesburg to Cape Town um, really uh, dynamically changed the project because one of the one of the things that uh, happened is that I fell passionately in love with the story of Johannesburg, uh, that city, uh, that tortured, vibrant city. It reminded me of Los Angeles. It reminded me of the city that I live in. Uh, and while the official story of apartheid organizes Johannesburg literally uh, in terms of racial categories, a reckoning and an aftermath that is still occurring. I see an echo of that in Los Angeles, the way that we built our highways, the way that we build our freeways, the way that we organize our neighborhoods, uh, the way that, uh, uh, that uh, race uh, uh, plays into the structure of, of, of how our maps were drawn. And so when I entered into the, the city of Johannesburg, uh, one of the things that became resoundingly clear uh, is that uh, William enters those maps, shows how they were drawn, shows who were drawing them, and iconoclastically redraws them, intervenes, gets inside of that process. And this and this intervention in how history is written enters into everything that he does, from his printmaking to the way that he makes a sculpture to the way that he makes a film. And so in, uh, in the Broad exhibition, I love these moments where, where, where William is entering into mediums showing the accumulation of a story. There's this amazing, I, I, I was, uh, worked with Warren Siebritz uh, in opening these archives of, of print material, looking at all of the separate states of prints from 1975, 78, 
1980, 1985, and finding these prints where, where, where William is, is cutting into the lino, working with the etching plate, uh, and slowly building those states up into what would eventually become the drawings for projection uh, and eventually would become animation. The great MoMA curator, Judy Hecker, had this theory uh, for a wonderful exhibition of prints that she did at the Museum of Modern Art about 10 years ago, where, uh, where this uh, point about William uh, is absolutely nailed by her and her catalog. Uh, that 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 you can't think about William without think you can't think about him merely through the lens of cinema and animation. Uh, all of that animating force enters into his maps, enters into all of these different mediums. So we're going to tell that story in the first gallery, and as we move through the show, uh, we're going to uh, move back and forth. Uh, between the story, the dynamic story of Johannesburg, uh, through which I'm hoping that uh, uh, there's a very popular term in Los Angeles called Los Angeles sees itself. This is a documentary or, or Los Angeles plays itself. So if William is playing the history of, of, of the history of Johannesburg, uh, he has this wonderful way of talking about hitting the stop motion button on the camera, rewinding it, replaying it, putting new frames in, uh, disrupting the chain of progress or what we think of as project uh, progress. So early in the exhibition, I really want to tell the story of Johannesburg uh, very intimately. Uh, I want people to know about the history of mining I want to know. I want people to know how uh, mining as a as a as a as a resource uh, led to all of this pain and suffering and the reorganization of the landscape of South Africa. And so, um, and so, we have drawings from uh, Return of Ulysses. We have drawings from City Deep. We have drawings from the Rand Ledgers. Uh, we have drawings from uh, Faustus in Africa. Uh, from basically every film in the drawing for projection. And the thing that unifies them is that they're all of Johannesburg and they're all rooted in this history. I think that that's absolutely essential because if you don't know the story about Johannesburg, you don't know this, that how William takes it apart uh, and, and analyzes his position inside of this narrative. And so without knowing about Johannesburg, uh, you're, you're, uh, uh, I, I don't think you're truly prepared uh, for Melies or for his anamorphic tables that focus on these, these uh, wider narratives of colonialism that, that occur uh, in Ethiopia or, or a work like Black Box that focuses on uh, uh, German East Africa, uh, what is now Namibia. Uh, or, 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 or Faustus in Africa's uh, retelling of Goethe uh, uh, through a, an African lens. I think all of that uh, is, uh, is enabled uh, and, 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 and deepened uh, by, uh, by, uh, by Johannesburg. And so I, I want that to be clear. And so, um, in, in, and as people walk through our exhibition, and enter the inventor in reverse and see all of these machines and interact with the magic of cinema. I'm hoping that that that, that story, uh, uh, that the underpinning of that uh, will, will add a, 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 a soberness, a melancholy to the proceedings that reminds people what this is actually all about. The crescendo of our exhibition is refusal of time. Uh, this is uh, going to be extraordinary. Uh, five channel projection, huge room, uh, a breathing elephant machine that registers uh, the history of global time down to a single human breath. Uh, uh, Williams collaboration with Peter Gallison uh, and uh, Philip Miller uh, and, and great dancers and composers and, and, and actors 
uh, flow into the refusal of time and, and make it uh, really, I, I call it a Johannesburg Roadshow. Uh, it takes the it takes the the studio of William and brings it right into your city, uh, and so this is uh, this is something that uh, that I'm very excited about, and I, I hope that people uh, enjoy. The refusal of time uh, sets the stage for everything that William is doing now. It flows into his Charles Norton lectures at Harvard. Uh, it flows into uh, uh, his performances of works like Orsonate. Uh, it uh, it flows into uh, his work uh, with the, the 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 porters in the head and the load in the in the thing that we will be showing the aspect of the head and load that we will be showing at the Broad uh, Kaboom. Uh, it goes into the flipbook animations, secondhand reading, Sybil. Uh, it explodes those early procession sculptures uh, and shows people how uh, they become um, uh, cursive and soft dictionary and rebus uh, and all of these all of these great sculptures that that William is is celebrating the celebration of making that is the that that is the essence of William uh, that after people go through refusal of time they'll they'll be um, uh, transported into William's uh, recent work. We have a catalog, uh, I'll show you a little bit about uh, how we're gonna program out this show, what we're gonna do. The catalog, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of. We have essays uh, uh, by uh, the great uh, South African novelist and playwright, Zeke Smada, uh, a wonderful artist and critic in New York, Anne McCoy, uh, writes about Kaboom and the Head and the Load. Uh, William has blessed us uh, with the reprinting of, uh, of performing the drawing, one of his uh, one of his lectures. Uh, and perhaps what I'm most excited about is William in conversation with the great sound and film editor Walter Murch. Uh, Walter Murch is an extraordinary figure uh, who uh, did sound and editing for The Godfather. Apocalypse Now, uh, and and has gone on uh, to um, uh, to have a uh, an interest in astrophysics and many many different eclectic uh, uh, trains of uh, of thought. Uh, he's the perfect interlocutor uh, for William, and I think that I think that you will really have fun uh, with this conversation. Uh, when you come and join us in Los Angeles, and I hope you will join us for our crazy sprawling exhibition, uh, uh, we have a, a wonderful conversation lined up between uh, the great uh, poet Claudia Rankine, uh, uh, who wrote one of the most important books uh, uh, published in the United States in the last 20 years, uh, Citizen. She has visited William. Uh, in Johannesburg, knows William, uh, and will be in conversation with William about Zipper Hall. And I and I hope that uh, this will be an opportunity to talk about uh, this, uh, some of the very important things that, that flow through William's work, especially about narratives, about race, uh, about, uh, about privilege. Uh, and so we're, we're greatly looking forward to that conversation. However, and it, and it must be said that uh, the one of the things that we are most excited about, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled beyond measure, uh, we will, after its workshopping in uh, Johannesburg, we will be presenting the world premiere of Houseboy, uh, the theatrical production directed by William. It's a collaboration between The Broad uh, and Red Cat. Uh, theater, which is the theater inside of uh, uh, Frank Gehry's uh, Disney Concert Hall. It's a collaboration uh, between us, Red Cat, uh, and support was provided by uh, Marion Goodman Projects uh, and the extraordinary collector uh, in Los Angeles, Brenda Potter. Uh, Brenda and her now departed husband, Michael, uh, are 
in my point of view, single-handedly responsible for Williams' popularity in Southern California. They were instrumental in collecting his early works uh, with donating uh, works to LACMA, uh, to the Hammer Museum, to MOCA, uh, to the Museum of Contemporary Art, San Diego. Uh, and Brenda has made an extraordinary contribution uh, to having this performance and getting this performance done in LA. So, this is what we have uh, put forth uh, in our um, city of Los Angeles, uh, working, uh, being honored to work with William, uh, who has been very open and inviting and, and, and uh, open to letting me dive through drawings from the late 70s, uh, visiting tapestry studios and, and foundries and, and talking with Philip Miller in Cape Town. Um, the access has been generous. Uh, his spirit has been overwhelming. And I um, thank you. Uh, visit us. V visit us in LA. You, you won't be disappointed. I, 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 uh, I, I think you will have a, a, a profoundly good time. Thank you. Uh, Ed, thank you so much for that absolutely phenomenal way in which you, uh, first of all, conceptualize the whole exhibition. I, uh, the only word I can use is phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. The insight, the depth of the manner in which you conceptualized uh, the whole exhibition. I was particularly struck by the manner in which your visit to South Africa and Johannesburg particularly shaped and influenced the, the way in which you went about uh, putting it all together, and uh, also the opportunity uh, to showcase how William plays Johannesburg, so to speak. One of the things is that William is, is very loyal to Johannesburg, and many of, uh, well, in fact, all of his exhibitions, uh, you know, he makes a point of showcasing them in Johannesburg, Johannesburg Art Gallery. He routinely donates all the publications to the, Jan the library of the Johannesburg Art Gallery, uh, and I think you draw on that, you know, and you show the strength uh, and everything that goes with it. And also, you know, looking at your holdings, you know, uh, I'm very impressed that you have such a vast array of uh, original drawings from other faces, because I think other faces, you, you mentioned that, I, uh, you know, when you mentioned Ethiopia and, you know, and Africa and so on. Uh, and in my mind, that is truly an absolute highlight in his oeuvre, you know, that uh, other faces, that stop frame animation. And I'm very pleased to see that you have so many of those drawings in your collection, in your own collection. Yeah. I, I agree. Other, mm. other faces mm. is really, mm. the, mm. you know, I, I, think, I think the moment for, for me where, where, where Soho enters contemporary Johannesburg That's it. Uh, and, and, That's and it. Brings, brings the story up to date. Uh, and and I, I think that the, I think that other faces really when I visited Johannesburg, uh, other faces echoed everywhere. Everywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. You are so right. You are absolutely right. Yeah. We are also very fortunate to speak to two very important curators in South Africa in Cape Town. Owen Martin is currently director and chief curator of the Novel Foundation and serves as a member of the Gerard Supporter Foundation. Prior to the Novel Foundation, he was registrar curator of Moving Image at Zeitz Mocha in Cape Town, leading Zeitz Mocha's collection management and exhibition registration team. In his role, he oversaw the movement installation, deinstallation, and care of Zeitz Mocha's collections and traveling exhibitions. In 2016, he co-curated a program of contemporary video art entitled Escape by Night, screened as part of the Cape Town's Museum Night series of events. He worked with the British Council, uh, Zeitz Collection in Sagera, Kenya, and Cape Town, South Africa. Puma Creative, Herzog Genaurach in Germany, and the H&R Block uh, Art Space in Kansas City in the USA. Martin holds a Master's of Art in Art History from McGill University in Montreal and a Bachelor of Fine Arts in both Art History and Painting from the Kansas City Institute in Kansas City. Uh, Owen, tell us about the Novel Foundation. 
With pleasure. Thanks so much for a warm uh, introduction, Wilhelm. Uh, it's much appreciated. So the Nobel Foundation was opened in April 2018 and is really dedicated to uh, sort of three things, the research, understanding, and care of 20th and 21st century visual art from Africa and the African diaspora. Um, but I wanted to sort of touch on a little bit of the motivation behind the institution, because of course, we're a very new museum, um, only existing for four and a half years. Um, so Norval, was, Norval Foundation was motivated by the Norval family's desire to really gift a dynamic and respected uh, museum to the South African public. After years of traveling the world, it became apparent to the founders that South Africa um, could really benefit from a cultural institution like the Beiler Foundation or the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art. And these two uh, institutions um, clearly benefited both a local creative world as well as the public at large in their respective countries. Um, they were also dynamic forces in the cultural life of, uh, of the countries that they, they exist in. And so really from an initial intention of creating a small institution that showed a private collection focused on artists from South Africa, the vision for the institution evolved into the creation of a museum that celebrates the visual arts of Africa and its diasporas. The aim from the beginning was to really to create a platform um, that celebrates uh, the work that's taking place here, the sort of creative practices that are taking place here. Um, and at the same time, I think there was a desire to learn from and borrow the relevant components or the relevant um, uh, examples taking place in other contexts. Uh, so that's just to give a little bit of a, a broad picture. Since, since 2018, we've undertaken 27 exhibitions and three atrium commissions um, with exhibitions of the work of Zanelli Mohole, Michael Armitage, David Goldblatt, among many others, and most recently, Grata Columba and a group exhibition entitled When Rain Clouds Gather, which is a survey of over 40 Black women artists from uh, South Africa working the second half of the 20th century. And um, so, uh, and so, a couple of years ago, you then mounted. You were part of mounting this exhibition. Correct. Yeah. So, the exhibition "Why Should I Hesitate," which is in two parts, really. The first part took place at Novel Foundation, and the second part, or the sorry, I should rather say, the other part took place at uh, Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art Africa. Is um, the title and the sort of catalyst for the exhibitions was taken from. Um, one of uh, William Kentridge's uh, um, recent operas, The Head and the Load from 2018. Um, and so that, that quote of why should I hesitate explores some of the paradoxes of Africa's involvement in the First World War. This, this question was first posed by an African soldier who had a difficult choice, accept conscription, leaving behind the security of his home to risk his life in a war of which he had little knowledge, or reject conscription and face certain persecution. Read in the context of Kentridge's practice, why should I hesitate is therefore a question that stresses the importance of process over procedure or product. It is an attempt to draw out the artist's work from the uncertainties of legend um, so that it can be understood within the context of an ever-changing uh, cultural climate, an exercise that resists inertia but is necessarily framed by doubt. So, Myself and Carl Nell, who will speak just now, curated uh, one component or one half of this project, Why Should I Hesitate Sculpture? Um, the visitors uh, that, that came to this, this exhibition encountered a range of new and historical artworks that, that Kentridge has produced over the last two decades, um, which narrates his, really his engagement with three-dimensional form. And I won't go into any more detail about that because uh, Professor Nell can, can take that up. But yes. I wanted to sort of just give a broad view of what, uh, what we were doing. And then also to note that, you know, Zeitz Mocha's exhibition looked at, um, which is entitled, Why Should I Hesitate? Putting Drawing to Work, Putting Drawings to Work, um, took Kentridge's drawing practice as his focal point. So the catalyst for that sort of exhibition was also the um, Kentridge's, uh, sorry, Kentridge's work as a, as a drafts, draftsman. 
Um, and that really staged one of the one of the largest exhibitions of of his forty year career, showing works including charcoal drawings, woodcut prints, stop frame animation, tapestries, installation, and video. Um, and in addition, it really paid a close attention to the role of his studio practice in his career. Now, you've seen a number of, um, of course, of catalogs that accompanied. Uh, Kentridge's, uh, the two exhibitions. And again, these were divided sort of into two parts. For our catalog that accompanied the exhibition, we undertook to do a catalog resume of, uh, of the artist's sculptural practice from really the earliest sculptures um, up to the present. So that goes to 2019. Um, and then we, uh, so that's a sort of visual um, catalog resume with the sort of the associated uh, artwork information. And then we also created, or we also commissioned rather, uh, two essays, one of which is written by Professor Nell, and the other is written by Professor David Friedberg, uh, who wrote uh, an essay entitled Seven Keys to Kentridge. And uh, Professor Friedberg is a art historian at um, Columbia University in their art history program. And so we felt having these two perspectives um, really brought together a, a divergent but complementary readings of uh, the artist's practice in sculpture. And I think that you know, largely speaks to um, the, the intention of the exhibition of bringing together, I think, these various, these two uh, significant aspects of, uh, of the artist's practice. And so with that, perhaps, should I pass it over to, to uh, Professor Nell to tell us a bit more about our exhibition specifically? I'm very pleased to introduce Carl Nell. Uh, he was born in 1955 in Petersburg in South Africa. He studied fine art at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, St. Martin's School of Art in London, and the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, he now lives and works in Johannesburg and until 2017 was associate professor at the School of Arts University of the Bipartisan. In 2018, he took up the post of senior advising curator at the newly opened Normal Foundation in Cape Town. Here, he has curated a program of major retrospective exhibitions, launching with Rediscovery and Memory, Sidney Kumalo, Ezra Mlachai, Serge Alain Getika, and Eduardo Villa. Accompanied by a scholarly catalogue, the undertaking set the tone for other exhibitions which have followed. On the Minds, David Goldblatt, Why Should I Hesitate, Sculpture, William Kentridge, All and Omega, Jackson Kilwane, and the Zanzibari Years, Emma Stern. Carl, tell us about the manner in which you went about putting this magnificent seminal exhibition together. So, <clears throat> The first meeting with w William was when we were building the Novel Foundation. And uh, here you see one of the, the largest of the galleries looking out towards the back of Table Mountain. The museum is uh, set in the winelands of the Constantia Valley. And this particular space uh, is specified to take eight tons per square meter and two tons per, per hook in the ceiling. And uh, I suggested to, uh, to Kentridge that we undertake a major sculptural retrospective in this space. Uh, William initially was daunted, uh, but nothing daunts uh, William uh, for particularly long. And uh, so some of the discussions uh, started and uh, we, uh, we, 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 in, we started to uh, look initially at how we would engage this large space. The discussions uh, went around uh, a, a body of work that he had been engaged in, uh, which are a series of lexicons. So in William's travels, he would very often come home and make a small sculpture that was related to what he'd been thinking or working with these Tiny sculptures were either made in wax or clay or cardboard and uh, glued together, and they had a very strong silhouette to them. They were placed on a series of white shelves, and uh, their arrangement looks as though they 
invite viewers to read them as letters or words, uh, something like an index or a dictionary, uh, a foreign alphabet. And um, so these tiny sculptures started to become the, the focus of a, uh, a series of works which would dominate the exhibition. So here uh, on the far right hand side, we can see a cat and uh, in the middle we see a pigeon, which will appear in the sculptures uh, that uh, emerge. So what we did is we built two models, one in Cape Town and one in, uh, in Johannesburg. And we worked either with paper cutouts or here with the uh, small three-dimensional models. And we started to look at how we would build walls. We would focus viewers through the very large space. And we needed to understand the scale of the works in relation to each other. So um, there were many discussions around uh, the uh, the build-up of the show from the earlier historic works to this final space with the large uh, uh, bronzes. We also um, placed some black and white images. I was very keen that the gallery space should reflect the, the studio space. And we see them on the right-hand side, uh, an image of, or two images of William in his studio that became uh, a huge uh, wall mural. Here I am with the with a, a lexicon installing it, and um, we see that um, the uh, the series of objects here uh, relate to a um, as I mentioned, almost kind of visual language. But there was a surrealist um, there was a surrealist game uh, which was uh, called a rebus where you would place a number of images in relation to each other to create a word. So um, they would, for instance, uh, uh, have a, an image of a cat, an ass, and a trophy, and that would uh, become catastrophe. So these were visual word games, and William starts to play with these in a, a three-dimensional manner. So we, we chose um, an, a number of uh, sculptures from these lexicons to start uh, scaling them up midway um, to uh, be placed within the space. And then did a further uh, decision to, um, to enlarge those. So here we see his, um, his sculpture uh, action. And uh, this is a, a mid-scale version in his studio. And um, <clears throat> we see in the background the enlarged version being made in polystyrene uh, and cardboard uh, on a huge scale, which would then be covered in plaster and, and worked on. There was a kind of brusqueness in the, uh, in the forms themselves that relates to Kentridge's interest in shadows. So uh, they started to become almost three-dimensional shadows. Here we see the large-scale version uh, of action uh, in, in the novel uh, um, gallery space. And uh, having come back from the foundry, you see the sheer monumentality and the uh, the daring reconfiguration of this vintage camera, which is um, which has these huge film reels, which are uh, surmounted on uh, what looks almost like a, a howdah or a, an elephant that uh, puts its first foot forward. And so he animates this camera. And uh, as he does with all the objects on the exhibition, the lenses look a bit like uh, um, old television screens. And of course, there is something anachronistic in the representation of the camera. This is not a, a new video camera. This is a, a very old fashioned kind of camera. And so in Kentridge's work, there is very often a nostalgic quality 
in the images that he chooses to reproduce. The, the title of the work action, of course, comes from, from foaming. And um, I think the, the sculpture has this huge presence. And uh, I think it becomes a sign for Kentridge's alter ego, his own distinctive view on the world, uh, the way that the camera has recorded history, politics, art, and um, of course, the stop frame animation of many of his early works is intimately involved with the, the camera. So we see a richness of interplay between the, the uh, three-dimensional image that he creates and, of course, the iconography that appears in much of his work. The, the camera, uh, this large camera, uh, was very popular in the, in the uh, tours that we took and uh, led to enormous discussions, uh, many uh, young people not knowing really what it was, uh, having uh, only telephones or very compact cameras. So uh, there was something very special in, uh, in excavating the past through technology uh, in these pieces. And uh, the Norval Foundation has many, many uh, school children who move through, uh, through the uh, galleries and are very involved with uh, trying to understand both contemporary and historic art. We, um, we move uh, across to, um, to William's studio in Newtown in Johannesburg and uh, uh, sorry, in Maboneng, uh, Johannesburg. And you can see the scale of his studio. studio. It is very often uh, like, a, like a theater or a stage in which uh, objects move, particular lighting comes in. And uh, we see the evolution of, uh, of sculptures and uh, prints and films happening simultaneously within the space. The, uh, the, in the background here, we see open uh, a, very large, uh, a, a very large corkscrew, which, uh, uh, which Kentridge is working on in here uh, in plaster. And uh, it's called open, uh, of course, like the camera, which is action. Um, open is... Uh, is uh, one of these uh, dynamic objects. And in the foreground, uh, we have um, the, the Cape uh, Silver um, uh, pot. So it is a, um, it's really a jug, sorry. It's not a, it's a pot. So it's a, it's a jug, which is uh, transformed into this large semi-female uh, figure. We, we, see um, open here moved down into the normal space with the huge uh, black and white images behind it and a, uh, a middle scale pigeon in the foreground and of course William and we had chosen to uh, to keep one of the sculptures in plaster so that the public could see the translation from plaster into bronze and um, it's uh, it also formed uh, visually a very strong contrast in the tonalities that were built into the exhibition itself. The, uh, the sculptures uh, were moved in, well, were moved down from Johannesburg to Cape Town by, by a truck, and uh, days were spent with um, gantries and with uh, spider cranes moving these large works into position and uh, a huge undertaking with uh, rigging teams and um, platforms which were built so that uh, they could be wheeled into position and then locked. Otherwise, it was impossible to get the fine-tuned placement uh, of pieces. A wonderful sculpture called Ampersand and uh, a very intriguing and um, 
uh, challenging monumental work. Uh, it points um, uh, where we all know that it is the and sign. I mean, to make a sculpture of an and sign in the first time, in the first instance, <laughs> is is really unusual. In the background, you also see a small sculpture called Hero, and um, the ampersand uh, sign, of course, opens up to uh, to an, uh, uh, opens up uh, significance on either side. So we say this and that, and uh, so it it is a sculpture that was pivotal in the reading of the large sculptural space. The um, the ampersand also looks a bit like a a uh, I suppose a critique on modern sculpture, uh, with its holes and with its uh, its sort of um, calligraphic sweeps and a kind of slickness to the form. Yet it has uh, an extraordinary presence to it that is quite mysterious. We see the ampersand here. Um, set in the gallery space with Table Mountain in the far distance. And uh, the, uh, we see a series of um, monumental bronzes and medium-sized bronzes here, the ampersand, the jug, the cat, and of course, action. All the works were shown, uh, all the smaller works were shown on their crates. Uh, and so there was a kind of roughness in the presentation of the work as well as an allusion to these works being in movement. The, the play within, the, um, within this space uh, was, uh, was unusual in that, for instance, the pigeon here in the foreground is a, is a medium-sized sculpture, and ampersand is a very large sculpture. So we spoke previously about the notion of rebus, so the, the ampersand would have bird and uh, action, or bird and uh, silver jug. So the, the viewers, as they entered the space, entered a three-dimensional rebus, and it had its own kind of theatrical quality to it. The works uh, shifted from some very small pieces that we saw in the lexicons, to the medium size and the large. So one was sometimes looming over an object, at other times uh, objects were looming over you. So it had a, a feeling of um, Alice in Wonderland where you were not quite sure um, uh, what scale you were or what your relationship to these pieces are. As you can see, they all are very dark, they are very tonal, and they feel like three-dimensional shadows. So here we have the, uh, the Cape Silver coffee pot, uh, that's really its title, being craned into position uh, at the novel and uh, extremely heavy objects. Uh, and um, they, they have, um, well, the, the jug particularly uh, has a very uh, feminine quality to her. She, uh, she seems to have a, a skirt. Um, the handle seems to be an arm out in the one direction. And um, this female presence is very much like, um, uh, I suppose what Giacometti does uh, with his feminine spoon, his female spoon in, in, the, uh, in European languages, in French, for instance, spoons are feminine. So, uh, Kentridge plays with this, so the, 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 the pot is feminine. In the background, uh, open looks um, quite masculine. And so one is constantly in this uh, play between objects having personas, and, uh, and Kentridge, uh, in, in many ways, looking at the theatrical relationship between them. In the background, you see him in the black and white photograph, uh, editing um, the, the plaster version uh, of Ampersand. And uh, we get the beautiful play here of 
the whiteness of the plaster, the blackness of the um, of the bronze, and the, the beautiful tonalities of the black and white images uh, of his studio. Here, um, William and I are working, walking through um, the studio space from the atrium uh, into the large uh, uh, space. And um, we, we see in the foreground a work called Night. And um, Night uh, is related to a number of other sculptures, um, one called Duke, other one called Duchess. There's the hero, which I pointed out previously. So there are a number of characters which play their way through the exhibition. And one starts to understand them through their various incarnations and scales. I um, installed this very large image of Kentridge at the entrance of the exhibition. And um, it sums up so many things about him. Uh, he uh, is a choreographer of Dada plays, of operas, of orchestral pieces. He creates uh, movable props for all these uh, encounters on stage. And uh, he, he talks to history of art, he talks to history of sculpture, and he, he has this megaphone uh, with this finger pointing forwards that he feels as though he is really a choreographer. And uh, this photograph talks in many ways of him as an authorial voice. And that the megaphone is anachronistic. It feels like uh, something out of the Russian Revolution. And uh, that, uh, of course, in, in Russia, those, the, the, um, uh, that image was associated um, with the role of dogma. And Kentridge's work very often questions the, the notion of dogma and power. And um, as an image of him, he seems to have a, a bicycle wheel, a Duchampian bicycle wheel as a halo, and uh, that he uh, is not an artist behind an easel. Uh, one feels that he has this multidisciplinarian uh, quality uh, within the work that he produces. So he is using the megaphones, the objects from many of the, uh, the operas that he did do, um, the nose, his refusal of time. Many of the objects in the smaller galleries were related particularly to these operas or presentations. And here we see the nose from uh, Gogol's um, story of this nose that goes on walkabout in the Shostakovich opera. And um, the objects are placed um, quite powerfully in, uh, in, the, in this kind of sculptural spaces uh, of, the, uh, of the five smaller units within the gallery. So one reads them very differently to the large scale of Gallery 8. Uh, a piece from the refusal of time, and <clears throat> it uh, was normally wheeled around the stage here. I place it on a platform. And uh, William, uh, when I asked him uh, if we should do a, a sculpture retrospective, he said to me, uh, do you think I'm a sculptor? I said, of course you're a sculptor. And uh, what was interesting for him and for me is that uh, by pulling out the, the sculptural works, one could see this very strong trajectory through his, um, through his uh, career of um, making works which alluded to different times. So here, you know, we see uh, Dadaesque qualities. We see the very strong Duchampian use of the ready-mades. And um, when I, um, when I suggested the exhibition and we spoke it through, I, I said to William that uh, I didn't want anything on the walls. 
because William uh, tends to proliferate onto the walls, floors, and everywhere. And uh, he wanted the sculpture seen against uh, white walls. And I, I said to him, I would really like to put them against gray walls so that the shadows started to relate to his drawings. So when one stepped into these spaces, they did feel as though they were part uh, of, his, of his drawings. In the long gallery space, there were smaller works, the polychrome heads, for instance, which uh, one sees very strong cubist influence of Picasso. William initially made these sculptures in, in cardboard, and they were cast in bronze and then meticulously uh, repainted. So they have cubist and surrealist uh, overtones, and they are a kind of conceit. So in putting these up on their stands, one felt, well, visually, you felt so you're going to pick them up and just pop them on the shelf, and they were extremely heavy. So they did challenge uh, one's, um, one's sense of physicality in the real world. The processions are very important in, as a theme in Kentridge's work. And uh, this is one of the late processions in commemoration of the migrant workers uh, in, in the Italian um, steel industry, a commissioned uh, work that uh, Kentridge uh, did. And uh, we, we see him here working with um, laser cutouts and uh, a whole group of figures, which uh, one sees a woman standing on, uh, on rolling stock in the, in the mid-ground area, and uh, a woman, uh, another figure with a clock right in the middle uh, of the groups. And uh, to, to the left of the woman on the rolling stock is a priest with a megaphone. And, uh, one sees a, um, a, uh, um, a trade unionist on the far right hand side uh, talking to, to workers. And so one sees within these the, the tension between the socialist trade unions and the church for the minds and hearts of the Italian steel workers. So Kentridge bridges political issues in South Africa through to Italy and one feels that though these are, are like three-dimensional ink drawings um, and uh, one sees the transference of this very uh, fluid and um, uh, almost brusque drawing with the ink but very precise being translated into, into three-dimensional form. Here we're not uh, throwing shadows on the back wall but they throw extraordinary shadows in their own right. A, um, a work which was just completed before uh, installation uh, called Waiting for Sybil, which was uh, part of a set uh, for uh, an opera which uh, Kentridge was choreographing. And um, what, what is uh, amazing about this piece is that you know, it, it looks like a, a, a group, uh, sort of a tangled group of uh, steel cutouts, uh, which are, are lit as you step into the room. And as the camera, as the, uh, as the um, projector goes through the form in one direction, you see a tree, and in the other direction, you see a typewriter. And uh, so Kentridge works with um, this, incredible precision in uh, capturing these two images that are conflated into one form. And of course, there are recreations of his brushwork uh, um, drawing. So uh, the, the exhibition really plays with Kentridge's uh, understanding of volumetric form, volumetric shadow, and here, uh, true shadow. Uh, as is uh, transposed onto the, onto the walls of this uh, gallery space. In the, uh, in the large atrium, um, I installed his uh, world on its hind legs, 
which is a huge uh, caught in steel work, which is about um, five, uh, four meters high, five meters wide. And it sat really beautifully within the space with the garden uh, of the novel um, seen behind it in one direction, and then perfectly contained within this very austere space. And this was the entry into uh, the exhibition. Uh, smaller versions of the sculpture were placed around it, so one could understand how this uh, image both contracted into itself and, uh, and um, exploded. So world on its hind legs is this image of the world on these two pylon-like uh, legs. So as with uh, much of Kentridge's work, everything becomes personified, be it the Cape Silver a coffee pot or the corkscrew, and here the world itself seems to stride. And so there was a very fixed point where you could see this image, which had a cross uh, on it on the floor. So I, I focused the viewers on seeing this. And then as one walks around it, it explodes into a series of planes. And here you can see um, how it disintegrates and eventually reintegrates on the other side to create a red circle, which you can see reflected in the window. So, Kentridge um, is, uh, is deeply versed in politics, art, music, philosophy, sculpture. And when one looks at a piece like this, which he worked with Herod Marx, uh, a younger sculptor on, um, where they conceived of this highly, abs seemingly abstract work that collapsed in on itself into these two images. A work like this could not have been produced um, uh, out of nowhere in the history of sculpture. One sees, of course, um, the history of collage, but uh, the, the work, the great steel sculptures of, of David Smith or Anthony Caro hover as ghosts around this piece. As, do, as does, um, uh, as does uh, Picasso or Duchamp. Or, so the whole exhibition uh, really uh, looks carefully at how Kentridge uh, absorbs the, the history of, of culture and of sculpture, art, and uh, of, a, uh, of a milieu that empowers the reading of work. So here we see the circle starting to move into space here. As Owen suggested um, or spoke about, uh, we did produce a, a catalog for this exhibition. And I um, wrote a piece called Off the Cuff to Monumental. And we see in Kentridge's work how he works with cardboard, he works with cloth, he works with a bit of clay or wax, or he works in a very spontaneous manner, which eventually is translated into these monumental works. And that rather than having a, um, a, a catalog which just has theoretical writing within it, uh, I chose to try and document uh, the evolution of Kentridge's sculpture. And alongside that, uh, as Owen mentioned, we created uh, the, the beginnings of a catalog resume of all the sculptures that Kentridge has produced so that it becomes a, becomes a document that uh, curators, collectors, um, auction houses, dealers, uh, and the interested public uh, are able to use and that at least pieces are pinpointed within this extraordinary trajectory uh, of, uh, of work that he has produced. Kentridge uh, is an unusual amalgam of withdrawn, serious, uh, aloof, uh, sometimes playful, supportive, empowering and generous. And one sees that in the way he collaborates, uh, be it with curators, with uh, fellow artists, with technicians. And so 
one senses that Kentridge really engages his uh, artistic community and his viewers in a complex language that is not just something that hangs on the wall or sits on a pedestal, but moves out into the centers of the world uh, as opera, theater, and uh, as these extraordinary video pieces where one sees images coming into being and that the museums and theaters are animated by the extraordinary presence uh, and intelligence of this remarkable artist. Uh, and uh, uh, Carl, that was absolutely fascinating, a very deep and insightful analysis of his work. And I think your last words really pay tribute to a remarkable, remarkable contemporary artist. And we're very fortunate to have uh, been able to speak to four of the foremost curators of vintage works in the world. I want to uh, kick off the discussion by looking at uh, by, uh, taking a mega view of the art of curating. And I think the most prolific uh, author in this uh, field is Hans Ulrich Obrist. No fewer than four publications, a brief history of curating, everything you wanted to know about curating, ways of curating, and 89 plus curating the future. Uh, and he also gives us a five finger exercise in it. Uh, what I like about his work is that he talks a lot about the delights and dangers of the art of curating. And in his mind, a curator is what he calls a junction maker, a catalyst, a sparring partner, an enabler. And I want to know from you, uh, uh, five curators, how would you describe a curator? Let's start with you, Melanie. When I think about the role of a curator, I think that there are multiple possible roles depending on the institution, depending on the artist or group of artists, and depending on the audience and kind of what the exhibition speaks to. For example, um, I curated several exhibitions when I was a college professor, and so I was thinking a lot about how to present work in ways that could open up conversations with students in a variety of fields, kind of to investigate larger questions through an artist's work or through a group of artists work, which is a very different way, I think, of curating an exhibition for a broad public. Certainly when I was thinking about the exhibition at the Warehouse Art Museum of William Kentridge's work, I was really thinking about um, being a catalyst to spark conversations and also wanting to kind of be a bridge between Kent Ridge's work and all of its fabulous complexity and people who maybe know a lot about Kent Ridge and also people who hadn't heard of him at all. So, I think of the role of a curator as multiple roles rather than as a singular role. I probably agree with Melanie that there is no single definition of what a curator does. I think it depends from institution to institution. And again, it depends if you're working with a living artist or you're working with a historical artist, uh, or if you're working, I mean, if you're working with a thematic show, again, it differs. So you know, I think a curator has to be a jack of all trades and master of none in many respects, because you have to you have to keep changing your approach depending on the material and the exhibition that you're working on. I guess the longer I do it, the stranger it gets. It's kind of, um, I don't know. I, I I've done I've done several um, um, conversations for books where you where you put two people in dialogue with each other and then edit yourself out. Uh, that that's kind of what curating feels like. Uh, where you where you have your audience and you have your artist and and you're in between, but you really shouldn't be present at all, other than as a Phyllis, uh, facilitator of the conversation. And so that's kind of how you know I, I I think some of the best curators are 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 the best at disappearing, uh, where mm -hmm. where their voice really isn't present much at all, and the artist um, sort of comes forth. I. I, I don't know if I'm very good at this, uh, but that's that's kind of how um, that's kind of how I think about it anyway. 
So, I, I mean, for me, I, I would I would definitely agree with with Ed and as well as Adrian and Melanie um, that uh, you know I think curatorial pr practice is you're an interlocutor, right? You're sort of somewhere between an art object, whether that's a physical thing or or, or not, and and the public. But I think you're successful if you and I, yeah, Ed, you said you sort of nailed it. If you can sort of disappear as much as that is, of course, possible. Um, and uh, if if you can facilitate uh, a project um, uh, so well that the, that idea or that thematic through an artist or artist or multiple artist practices uh, comes forward. I think we we all feel as though we are part of a community that uh, try to engage both the artist and the public in uh, the most coherent way possible. And uh, I find as a curator that the space uh, in which I am uh, installing an exhibition really uh, very often is, uh, is, is the catalyst to how uh, I work. And uh, that uh, at Norval Foundation, we've, we've had this extraordinary sculptural space built, which uh, is able to house uh, monumental works. And that enabled us uh, to work closely with Kentridge to, to make enormous works for the space itself. So uh, in curating, uh, I quite like to focus uh, on a particular aspect rather than doing a very large uh, smorgasbord show, uh, I like to help the viewers understand uh, a particular line within the artist's work. And as, as many of you have spoken about, it is inevitably this dialogue between my, oneself as the curator and the artist and the dialogue with the public. And that uh, I've always admired uh, Tate's uh, uh, use of wall texts in that if there is not a curator taking somebody around a show, that those wall texts are, are really uh, powerful cues for the general public to access the exhibition, because these are very complex languages that we are involved in trying to share. Okay. Um, another uh, author in this regard is uh, Terry Smith and uh, his recent publication, Thinking Contemporary Curating. And what I like about uh, him is that these are the issues that he raises in terms of curating. Current discourse on the topic is heating up with a new cocktail of bold ideas and ethical imperatives. I think many of you mentioned uh, them, but let's just go through them. These include cooperative curating, especially with the artists, the reimagination of museums, curating as knowledge production, the historicization of exhibition making, and commitment to extra art world participatory activism. Less obvious, but increasingly of concern, are issues of rethinking spectatorship, engaging viewers as co-curators, and the challenge of curating contemporaneity itself. Melanie, uh, I think you mentioned the idea of uh, spectatorship. Well, I think when I think about spectatorship, I think about keeping the viewer foremost in mind. And I agree with what's been said about the, the curator ideally sort of disappearing from the conversation and almost facilitating you know, the, the conversation between artist and audience or artist and spectator as though we're running in the background. Um, at the same time, I'm aware as a curator that I do bring my own vantage point, right? That I am grounded in my own vantage point whenever I'm doing my work. And so when I'm thinking about spectatorship, I'm having to think about sort of what is my what is my practice of looking? What lenses or filters am I looking through? And so where am I in that conversation? And where am I in shaping that conversation? Even if my hope is that people won't really notice I'm there. I think this also ties to uh, Terry Smith's point about curating as knowledge production, because we inevitably are, whether we're, whether we're showing the work of lots of artists or curating a show that's focused on a strand within one artist's practice, I think that we are inevitably 
producing knowledge from our particular standpoint as part of that complex conversation around, around looking, around being a spectator. Uh, uh, Adrian, for you, what is paramount of all of these issues that Toby Smith raises? Mm. Oh, I think that, I mean, yeah, it's a very uh, uh, tight summary there, isn't it? I mean, there's so much more to consider when, when you're working in a space, when you're considering the audience you want to attract, when you're considering the resources you have at your disposal, when you think about how much time you have available to make a show, uh, there are so many uh, unknowns when you set out on, on an exhibition and clearly, you know, when you're working with an artist like William, then uh, a large part of what you're doing is, is reflecting what he wants to see as well and what works that he wants to show. Um, so, you know, it's... Um, of course, one wants to engage new audiences and one wants to reach out, but you're, you're having to sort of uh, satisfy multiple stakeholders in many ways. So it's, mm -hmm. there's never a straight answer, I don't think, to how you, you do it. You want to be uh, engaging, you want to be entertaining, you want to be provocative, but you also want to do justice to the artists. So there's so many different things to consider. Um, but, it, it, you know, ultimately, I always think of of an exhibition as um, a, a tool for education. You know, people come, you want people to take away something, you want people to learn something, hopefully you whet their appetite, they want to find out more about the artist or the movement or whatever it is you're showing, so that it, it's a sort of, you're having to satisfy a very uh, different audiences. As Melanie was saying, there are people who know nothing, there are people who know a great deal. You need to strike a balance that allows everyone to take something from the experience. Okay. Uh, it, um, uh, uh, Adrian alluded to it, and the idea is that William is a great collaborator, and I think you experienced that firsthand when you came out to South Africa to Johannesburg. Tell us more about, uh, you know, how the, the, the art of collaboration impacts on curating a show such as the one uh, that you have put together for the break. Well, I mean, exper experiencing William's expansive universe in Johannesburg is 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 completely overwhelming and it's very um you know it's it's a it's a real it's a real challenge to convey that uh to uh an audience completely on the other side of the world one of the things that um that sort of became apparent as we think about our audience in Los Angeles is that um it's 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 not only necessary. It's 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 absolutely imperative uh, to to uh, to show uh, William as a collaborator, uh, because uh, in the in the climate that we're in uh, in 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 Los Angeles, which which I think is very similar to uh, to Johannesburg, uh, it's a it's a city that's that's ruptured by racial division. Uh, it's a it's a city where. Uh, maps are laid out according to industry and according to wealth uh, and according to power, uh, all of which William speaks to. Uh, but we're we're really in a moment where you know if you're a single individual, uh, you know trying to work everything out for yourself, that's very dangerous ground. It's terrifying ground, and I think that I think that uh, one thing that William um, is you know extraordinary at you know from the very beginning from the junction days into the handspring days uh is that is this idea of of getting in the room with so many different people uh and and working through a, a difficult subject together uh and 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 coming to coming to not not a not a solution uh that's not what he does uh but uh but but that that idea of uh, that there has to be multiple voices uh, uh, to 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 get involved properly with a problem, uh, and so um, I don't know. But he's also this major figure. That's the that's the irony, right? <laughs> like he's this you know he's one of the most well known artists on earth. Uh, so so that that is. Uh, um, that's the challenge. You know, you want you want to put that collaboration front and center, 
uh, but you also want to give credit where credit is due. So that's what I, that's what I, uh, yeah. okay. we'll, um, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> So, uh, uh, so a couple of other publications, The Culture of Curating and The Curating of Cultures. There's even a curator's handbook. Now, now Carl, if you have to suggest three chapters for a curator's handbook, what would the titles be? Mm. Gee. Um, you mentioned well, space. I, I suppose, uh, f firstly, uh, one has to uh, have uh, the, the knowledge to choose the artist who you're going to curate. Uh, one does need to understand the context in which the artist works and uh, how, one, uh, how one represents that within either the, the um, embedded culture, as we've seen with Kentridge here in South Africa, or how one shows him in Los Angeles or in London. So, um, uh, you know, those are, are pivotal points. And then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the gallery space itself uh, and its context is absolutely crucial. You know, one, uh, if, if one doesn't have the right uh, venue or, or space for somebody like William, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to, to actually present him. But, you know, at the same time, uh, he, you know, he doesn't operate in a warehouse uh, or, or, you know, uh, at the Met, at the Met in the center of New York. So uh, nothing really phases him. So uh, the, the, the challenge as a curator, I think, is to be open to the, to the artist that you're working with. So, I mean, William is a, as, um, as Ed said, you know, he's a co-curator really. Uh, in the project, and I think that's what's really exhilarating, uh, that uh, one is involved in that dialogue that we were talking about earlier in uh, creating an exhibition uh, for, uh, for every venue in which he uh, undertakes to do it, and that he is, he is a choreographer, um, and uh, he could not do all the work that he does do without this remarkable team. And it's been a real privilege, certainly in the exhibition I did, to work with both William, but also with this extraordinary team uh, that just keeps it running even when he's not there. Um, this one is for uh, Owen. Um, and I want to ask you two questions. You know, the idea of uh, the, when artists create uh, mm. and whether we are over curating perhaps in our institutions. <clears throat> Well, I think actually, I think the, the previous question about, you know, when artists curate is, is actually perfect for Carl, because of course, Carl is, uh, is also a practicing artist um, and, and sort of has to think along two lines. So maybe Carl, sorry, Wilhelm, if you don't <laughs> mind if I sort of push that with that one along, but I think it's interesting for, for him to respond to that. But, yeah. Well, you know, I think as, uh, uh, as a curator um, and as an artist, uh, uh, one has to find the balance uh, between uh, one's own uh, aesthetic preferences and those of the artist that you're curating, and to find the correct uh, curatorial language for for each of each of them. Uh, for instance, uh, with William, uh, when I when I suggested that we do a purely sculptural uh, uh, exhibition at at Norville, he said, well, he didn't think he was a sculptor. And uh, as an artist, I have watched him over 30, maybe 35 years evolve. And uh, to see uh, how as an artist, he you know, has spread into so many, many disciplines in a very, very powerful way. And that one could curate uh, uh, five Kentridge shows uh, by focusing either on his operas or just purely on the drawings or or on the um, on the uh, animations, uh, so um, I think as 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 curators and as artists, we have this capacity to to focus and to be um, 
to show as appropriately as possible uh, in relation to the milieu that the artist produces in. Okay. Uh, uh, and so, Owen, do you think uh, we are over curating perhaps in our institutions? I'm not, you know, I think that depends on the context, right? Because it, South Africa is not the same as the UK or the United States. Um, and I think the, yeah, I think it, I think it really, really shifts based on the, con the context. I do think there is possibilities of sort of um, working with a certain amount of openness, right? Of sort of uh, working with a certain amount of exper or experimentation, I should say. So, you know, when, uh, when approaching an artist, often the, the first thing I ask them is what, is, what is it you haven't done? What is the thing that's sort of at the back of your mind that you've, you've wanted to explore, an idea, maybe it's just the genesis of an idea that we can sort of try to tease out, right? And to sort of expand upon. And I think in some respects, you know, focusing on William's sculptural practice, which is a much more recent and um, and perhaps uh, not as well sort of appreciated or well um, uh, considered aspect of his practice um, was also really, I think, effective starting point for us, you know, thinking about an aspect of his practice that uh, is been more based in, you know, the stage, right, in terms of set design. Um, and then taking that and, and expanding that and then ultimately working, you know, with his studio and, and commissioning large scale bronze sculptures, which again was sort of, is sort of a more recent exploration for him and from him. So I, I suppose it's about keeping a certain openness and a sense of sort of play and experimentation, which, um, yeah, in at least for me, uh, you know, in the work that I do. Okay. Uh, for me, ultimately, all four your shows, uh, are writing art history, uh, and uh, I'm uh, I'm um, led by these two volumes, the five uh, volumes uh, exhibitions that made art history, and I think all four your exhibitions are making art history. But I want to uh, hear from each one of you in what manner you think you're contributing to the writing of contemporary art history, Melanie. <clears throat> Compared to the other three exhibitions that are represented here, uh, our, our show at the Warehouse Art Museum is, it's much smaller. It's a very intimate show. It certainly is driven in many ways by its space, which people who are watching this will have, will have seen when you look at you know, the floor plans and the views of the various exhibitions. Um, it's also driven by um, the collection that we are exhibiting work from. So in some ways, it's, it's an exhibition with a very different set of parameters. And I think, I feel like it would, it's, there's some amount of hubris in me saying that I think that the exhibition is making art history. What I think that it's doing is participating in this larger right now worldwide conversation about William Kentridge and how to show the work of William Kentridge to remind us that there is this, along with the monumentality say of those fabulous massive sculptures, the tapestries, the films that are meant to be seen large, the opera sets, there's also an intimacy to some of his work, to some of his smaller scale work and so I feel like what we're doing in terms of making art history perhaps is um, keeping that intimacy, that smaller scale, um, that invitation to a kind of close up sort of engagement with the work and a reflection in the conversation and reminding, maybe reminding art history that, art, that there are multiple aspects to an artist's practice as other people have mm -hmm. said and that there are ways to, to think about those in dialogue perhaps with the massive monumental um, kinds of work that is becoming more and more known. Adrian, the, the Royal Academy has a long illustrious history. Is, one, is this one of your big ones? <clears throat> well, you know, it's not been that long since we started doing major monographic shows of living artists and um, William is among a handful of artists who've had that opportunity um, but he's also I think significantly the first African artist to have a solo exhibition at the Royal Academy which is you know uh, in itself a little little bit of history um, but I, I, 
I mean, I never look really at the, where the, the, the exhibitions I work on fit in terms of a grander, longer history. I just look at where they, you know, where they work and where they don't work and what's good and what's bad about them. Because I think everyone is always very self-critical of their own shows and have moments where you think well, that could have worked out better or this could have been better. But, you know, I think the staging of William's shows is, has been alluded to, you know, is really, really important. And he has a long-term collaborator in Sabine Turnison, who we've worked with at the Royal Academy, and who's also going to be working at the Broad, or is working at the Broad, I should say. Um, and so the William, it's not, in some ways, William is happy to put artworks on the wall, but he also wants to have this uh, engagement and kind of reflection, which I think is what goes back to what we've been hearing about his early days in the theatre, um, his love of spectacle, his love of surprises, you know, and, and staging is really, really important to him. And I know he always says, you know, I'm a failed actor um, and I turn to art as the sort of second best option, but he's a pretty good actor too. I mean, if you've seen him on film, you know, so he, uh, he's a man of, of mystery, I think. He he's, he's, um, keeps us all get second guessing what he wants to do a lot of the time. Um, and that's part of the fun of working with him. Um, so for me, uh, you know, it's, it's less about history, more about the honor and privilege of working with someone like William, to be honest. Mm. Uh, Ed, what I find fascinating about uh, your exhibition is the synergy you uh, you established between Los Angeles and Johannesburg. That certainly makes it unique in my mind. Um, yeah, I I, I I I I hope so. I mean, that that was a real revelation to me going to going to Johannesburg. Um, but to 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 build off your question, I, I'm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I've ever felt art history being written before ever in my life uh, until um, until recently, uh, until you know, just over the past five to ten years. Uh, you know, Los Angeles has gathered you know a gargantuan amount of money to contextualize itself uh, as as a center, as a center, as a as a leader in global cinema. Uh, and you know it's it's happening all at once and right in front of my eyes, right in front of everybody's eyes. Museums are opening, books are being written. I don't know if I've ever felt you know such devotion to a single subject. And so, um, you know, in terms of William and what Adrian was saying about uh, William being this performer, this. Uh, this this uh, uh, this gentleman that that sets the stage that gets into histories uh, like cinema. Uh, uh, what what Carl said about about sculpture, his his contributions to sculpture. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing that if this exhibition actually runs a little bit against the grain of mm -hmm. of that cultural production in 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 Los Angeles uh, and and and. And really demonstrates that that the that the that the that the power of having a center, you know, comes with a lot of pitfalls. Comes with a lot of uh, comes with a lot of collateral damage. Uh, I don't know if anyone is going to notice, <laughs> but we we'll, we will see. Uh, yeah, abs abs absolutely. I did want I did want to say uh, um, Carl's catalog for the for the sculpture show. Uh, you know, reading through that catalog, you know, I really, I really kind of felt like I was watching art history unfold. Uh, that extraordinary essay where, you know, it's kind of like William as a sculpture where all of these different fragments that existed, mm -hmm. all of these different shows and different pieces and props inside of larger installations. Uh, and, and Carl really you know, really gathered them together and, and made this, you know, really compelling case. And, you know, that's really, you know, what I think of when I think of art history. No, no certainly. Uh, uh, Carl, the fact that you documented that you actually put together, you initiated a catalog resume of uh, William's uh, uh, Tempage sculpture, I think, uh, is, uh, is definitely a first and uh, really worth, uh, worth talking about in terms of art history. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think for all of us as curators to have to have catalogs that enable us to look at the range of an artist's work is always incredibly helpful. 
you know, if I look at the very modest catalogues uh, which have documented many works in South Africa uh, since I was a boy, those have sat in my head. And so, you know, for me, it was a real gift to William to be able to create that chronology uh, around his sculptures, which he, he hadn't really um, acknowledged. In terms of art history, I think uh, Kentridge is incredibly uh, literate uh, in terms of art history. So, you know, in looking carefully at his sculpture, we see, we see, the, Surrey, we see the influence of Surrealism, we see, um, we see Dada, we see incredibly strong influences of Picasso's sculpture of using found objects and then casting them to bronze. And that when, when you look at his iconography, he is really a nostalgic uh, artist. He is, um, his language is, are the masterpieces of, of art. So he, he replays back um, art history to his viewers who see the greatness of, you know, uh, looking at German Expressionism or at Picasso, or, you know, they, they understand the language. And so he is a kind of art historical ventriloquist, and uh, it. Uh, but he animates that history in an extraordinary manner. So his work is not particularly African at all. Uh, it really is high European art, and uh, the story that he tells is a kind of narrative using this Western language, and uh, and really looking at the the combination of a living community in making this visual narrative, the sound narrative. On our exhibition, you know, we, we did uh, work with William in making these huge uh, um, bronzes, which were like solidified uh, shadows. I mean, for him, shadows are so important. So mm. these monumental shadows, became presences and they were quiet. Uh, but, you know, when one looks at, uh, for instance, action, the big camera, you know, it's not, a, it's not a small video camera. It is an anachronistic cinem cinematic object from old Europe or from early Hollywood. Uh, so, you know, it, it harks back in a kind of romantic way to that, but he animates everything. Uh, and uh, creates genders for these objects, which uh, play with the Surrealist uh, games of Rebus. And so the, the reading of the work is never um, circumscribed. If anything, you know, it continues to open and he disrupts narratives constantly like a poet, which uh, it's different to reading a telephone directory uh, and a poetry book. Uh, that uh, one, one senses the, the velocity in William's work that he plays off uh, against his collaborators in the most remarkable way. So uh, I think the, the art history is absolutely inherent in his language, and uh, we try to make it in, uh, sort of inherent and coherent within the, within the uh, catalogue book for the exhibition. Okay, there you are, people. Uh, I present to you the foremost curators of Kentridge. Maybe we can end by a last word from each one of you, the experiences in your own minds of curating Kentridge. Just the last few words from each one of you. Melanie, let's start with you. It's an honor and a privilege to curate William Kentridge's work. I haven't had the opportunity to meet him. Um, I had much, much less time to work on the exhibition than you all did, to work on the exhibitions that you have brought together in such stunning ways. And so I'm really excited that William will be, in, if I may address him by first name when I haven't met him yet, that he will be in Milwaukee in November and I will finally have the opportunity to meet him and to see what he thinks of the exhibition. Um, but it's, but I feel like I've, you know, I've gotten to know him a bit through through reading, through watching lectures, through all the possible ways that one can get to know somebody in our current time without actually meeting them. 
And it really has been such an honor to deepen my knowledge of an artist whose whose work and whose being I've admired for so long. Uh, Adrian, and you? <clears throat> well, I think, you know, it's uh, the four different exhibitions that are being discussed in this forum, each one of them is incredibly different. Not, there's no replication in those shows. And, you know, it's, a, it's one of the things about William is there is a lot of work. I mean, he's a very, very hardworking, prolific artist. Um, his, as we've just heard Carol say uh, eloquently how, you know, quick-witted William is and how erudite he is and how he spans so many different things. So, you know, to have time with him, time in the studio, time in the galleries, to talk about ideas, to talk about paths the exhibition might take, to be uh, privileged enough to go and see some of the performances that he's done live, like The Head and the Load or The Return of the Sybil. I mean, it's just, it, it's kind of, it, it's intimidating working with William in, in many ways, because he is, he, you know, there is so much to try and understand and to absorb, but he's incredibly generous with his time. He's very uh, warm. He's very affectionate. Uh, He's a real uh, family. I mean, you all know he's a very much a family man uh, and his collaborators are all part of his extended family. Um, so it's an enormously rewarding and enriching experience as well, working with William. And at the RA, we've had two weeks of non-stop dinners and performances and opening receptions and so on. And I'm going to be slightly bereft when it all comes to an end because I'm not going to know what to do with my time, you know. But uh, it's just an extraordinary experience. Uh, it. Mm -hmm. Well, just to, uh, just to echo what Adrian said, uh, it you know it is it it is somewhat intimidating for sure. I I, I couldn't I couldn't believe when I um, when I was in Johannesburg and sort of studying in an upstairs room of his studio, uh, he comes in and sits down next to me and. I had nothing to say. I, you know, I read, read thousands of pages, and I, I, I could, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I squeezed out a single word, uh, because he's, uh, it's such a large world, uh, and and it gives you access to so many, so many different things. And I think, I think curating this exhibition, and and seeing the world through William's eyes, or or or, or attempting to uh has um has has really sort of laid bare some of the narratives that, about my own country that i had never seen before um some of the some of the you know very intense rhymes between the united states and and south africa and, and sort of parsing out the, what's similar and more importantly what's different uh and and william's work um allows you to do that and, and sort of lets you take apart history um you know as it's being written or or as it has been written to not trust that to to let shadows into that and i think that that you know that that's extraordinarily valuable and i it's something that i'll i'll remember forever <laughs> i hope that i really i i and i hope that uh, i hope that audiences uh, feel the same way in 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 los angeles just I, I've, I've spoken too much, but I, I really, you know, I really felt that with with Adrian's show at the Royal Academy. You know, here is, you know, you know we're we're in the very week that the that the that the the Queen is laid to rest, uh, and to and to experience uh, William's work in that context. It's and then and then experience him in the context of of, of Cape Town and and Los Angeles. This is extraordinary. I can't think of any other artist that uh, you know that can enter all of these very wildly different worlds and take them all apart. Mm -hmm. Okay, I call the last word to you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think William had an extraordinary training ground uh, here in South Africa, with uh, with the political context, with his parents as these remarkable lawyers, and of course within his family, you know. Um, uh, reading philosophy, listening to music, opera, you know, 
this was um, the seedbed for uh, an extraordinary mind and a creative individual who was uh, never feared to make a mistake and to move from discipline to discipline. And he is a great synthesizer on a, a thought level, on a visual level, on an art historical level, on a human level. Um, his generosity in his collaborations uh, uh, pull in large numbers of people and of course into our museums as well. He enlivens the museums in a way that pulls the public in because they are visually challenged, uh, but that they are also, um, they sonically uh, challenged. They are incredible videos. And so uh, there is a constant sense of movement. And, you know, on our exhibition, you know, we had singing sewing machines, uh, you know, in amongst the, the monumental works and uh, a drum set that went off every 20 minutes that deafened everybody and kept everybody absolutely mesmerized. <laughs> so um, I think for, for me, the, the great experience has been to uh, curate William and to be curated by William. And that uh, it is the beginning where we started about uh, what this, uh, what curation is, and it is this dialogue. And as I said earlier, the great privilege of working not with works of somebody who is dead, but somebody who is here and prescient and uh, is um, pushing our boundaries as uh, as curators, but the public's and and humanity's boundaries. So. William encompasses on a huge scale.